Our next speaker is Ivan Shuvich uh, from the University of Geneva. Uh, and today he's going to tell us about self-testing tensor products. So take it away, Ivan. Okay, well, thank you, Paul. And I would also like to join the, the other speakers who, who thank the organizers. So it was a, it has been so far a very enjoyable conference. And well, I still hope we'll manage to see each other in, in Warsaw in future when, when the occasions allow. So well, this is a, a, a short uh, title of, uh, uh, of my presentation. So uh, yeah, it's uh, the name of the manuscript is called actually device independent certification of tensor products of quantum states using single copy self-testing protocols. And it is done in collaboration with Joe Bols and uh, Danny Cavalcanti from ICFO. So here you have um, archive, uh, archive code for it. And well, it is accepted for publication in quantum. I think it should, it should happen soon. Okay, so um, before talking about self-testing, uh, we can remind ourselves a bit about Belknap locality. Well, I'm fairly sure that most of you know quite a lot, but okay, let's just uh, briefly uh, recap. Uh, so we have uh, two observers, usually called Alice and Bob, and their query, their devices that are not characterized with some inputs X and Y, and they obtain outputs A and B, and then they'll, uh, they can um, they can collect the the of the correlations, so they can find the observed correlations P probability of A B given X Y, and then Bell inequality. Well, it's some functional of 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 these uh, of these correlations. And then the, the correlations that violate Bell inequalities, uh, they do not admit local decomposition. So uh, local decomposition says that uh, probability is created by Alice and Bob by using some local hidden variable. And then Alice just based on the value of the hidden variable and her input uh, outputs A and Bob outputs B based on hidden variable and, and his input Y. Well, so if, uh, as I said, so. Uh, correlations violating Bell inequalities do not admit such a local decomposition. And also, moreover, all separable states uh, produce correlations that admit this local decomposition. So some 15 years ago, or I don't know how long ago, uh, people nicely saw that Bell inequality violation thus can be seen as a device independent certificate of entanglement. So without uh, trusting the dimension of the system or any inner functioning of the of the measurement devices, we can in a device independent manner certify entanglement. So now self-testing comes uh, as an answer to question, well, can we device independently certify something more than just presence of entanglement in the in the in the state shared by Alice and Bob? And well, uh, briefly it can be said it can be said that the device independent uh, uh, protocol aiming to recover the exact state and measurements from the produced correlations, it is self-testing. So on one side, if you know what are the measurements uh, that Alice and Bob applied and what is the share, the state they share, Born rule helps us to find the, the probabilities of correlations. And then here, well, the question is if we can do something that goes the other way around, can we recover the state and or the measurements from the observed correlations? So in that sense, somehow self-testing can be seen in two, two ways. So one more with, with more practical, idea that it is indeed device independent certification of measurements and states. And uh, the other uh, is we want to see it as more as a, basically a theoretical tool that just states that there is a inverse map from the uh, set of correlations to the um, experiments leading to that. Okay, so uh, to, to help myself with the, with the terminology, I will just uh, I will just introduce it briefly. So, like on one side, we have experiment that we want to certify, and that uh, we will call reference experiment. While the actual experiment we have, we'll call physical experiment. So, physical state is the state that Alice and Bob share. Physical measurements are the measurements they prepare. While the reference are those that we want to certify. Now, well, that, since we are in a device independent scenario, it is impossible to prove uh, uh, that physical experiment and reference. Experiment and reference experiment are identical. That is because, for example, well, uh, the, there can be a local change of basis of the measurements and the end of the states or some uh, embedding in a Hilbert space of higher dimension. So uh, uh, there is a notion of local isometry that encompasses all of these, uh, all of these transformations. And thus, we cannot prove that we have exactly reference experiment, but we can only prove that uh, the physical experiment belongs to a 
equivalence class to which reference experiment belong, and this equivalence class is determined by local isometry. Uh, so we are not proving a, um, identity, we are proving equivalence. And mathematically speaking, we can write it like this. So we have this local isometry U that maps uh, the state Psi AB, this is the physical state, and then we added some ancillas, uh, and it maps it to, uh, it extracts the, the reference state Psi prime to the anc ancillas, and then we have in, in the Hilbert spaces A and B some, something that we'll call just junk state. And similarly, if you want also to, to self-test measurements, even though there are other ways to do it, but this is one way, so we want to show that the same local isometry maps the action of the physical measurement on the physical state, it extracts on ancillary Hilbert spaces like the reference measurement acting on the reference state. Okay. And then the emblematic example of, of self-testing is actually a CHSH inequality. That is something that people understood at the end of 80s. So well, we have this CHSH inequality whose uh, who's, uh, classical, whose local bound is two. And we know that every time we have more than two, we certify that there is some entanglement. But maximal quantum violation is two square root of two. And then uh, it was uh, proven that observing this maximal violation implies that the shared state is maximally entangled. So here, uh, not to lead you through the proof for these things, but the key insight is uh, the observation that the measurements applied by both parties must be anti-commuting if we observe a uh, maximal violation of two square root of two. So in some sense, uh, this, is, uh, this is crucial because every time we can identify an anti-commuting pair of observables, we identify a qubit, uh, qubit subspace. Okay, so uh, in the last, uh, I don't know, 10 years, so we, we, we got a lot of results in, in self-testing. So besides uh, self-testing maximal entangled state, we know how to self-test GHZ states, GHZ state, all bipartite pure states, many classes of multipartite states that involve some symmetries like DK states or uh, QDIT uh, GHZ states and graph states. Uh, and then well, the procedure was also extended to other scenarios, not uh, just device independent, but uh, to steering, prepare and measure, scenario with quantum inputs. Uh, then we also learned that quantum processes can be self-tested, not just states and measurements. And we can do something weaker, show, for example, not that uh, our state is equivalent to some particular state, but that uh, it can be through local isometries brought to a specific generally entangled subspace. So uh, there is a lot of results in, in self-testing in the last 10 years. And the one that, uh, that I want here more to concentrate that I didn't mention in the previous uh, slide is the self-testing of tensor products. So uh, what here it means, so reference experiment here is a tensor product of, in this case, n maximal entangled pairs of qubits, and they are shared between two parties. And uh, on every pair, the parties uh, measure local CHSH observables. And now, if we observe that uh, we have n, that every, on, so on every subsystem, we have a maximal CHSH violation. If you observe n CHSH violations, it allows us to establish the equivalence between the physical state and the reference state that is tensor product of n maximal entangled pair of qubits. So there were also several results that uh, prove this. I, I just mentioned this one. So, and then as in the case of just one uh, CHSH inequality, so uh, every maximal CHSH inequality evaluation implies the existence of an anti-commuting pair of observables applied by both, uh, both pairs, uh, applied by both parties, not pairs. Pardon. So we get anti-commuting uh, n anti-commuting pairs but then here, since we have n of them, uh, we should prove that they are independent. So the key now of this proof is not just this part of anti-commuting that trivially comes from, from NCHSH violations, but the idea is to prove that, uh, that these different pairs are actually commuting. And once we get this, we kind of uh, boil down the thing to, n tens to tensor product of n local isometries that we have, if all of them commute. and every anti-commuting allows us to build a local isometry. Okay, so uh, now we wanted to dig a bit uh, more into this, uh, into this question about how to self-test tensor products and, uh, and what conclusions can we get. So, well, I will just go to this slide and here is if you have just one, uh, one self-test. And then this is the, the situation that we had previously in um, self-testing tensor product of NCHSH uh, 
of n maximum entangled pair of qubits. So we give n inputs to Alice and to Bob, or input is a string of bits, of n bits, and we get the outputs. And then this x1 and y1 determining what should be measured on the first subsystems. And then the part is output a1 and b1, and then so on. So, well, Coladangelo proved that if, if these probabilities a1, b1, given x1, y1, and then until n, if they all violate maximally CHSH uh, inequality, then we get the tensor product of n, n maximum entangled uh, pair of qubits. So now our question is how general is this, uh, is this question? So does it hold if I have, for example, many uh, independent self-tests, and then I just put them together in one box. So if 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 I would have n, I would need n boxes in each party to to self test this. But if I put them in one, and I give n inputs, and I receive n outputs, and if each of them individually satisfies their self testing criterion, can I get the the final conclusion that I have tensor product of my reference experiments? And then, well, here there is a bit of, of, of math uh, about this. So I cannot go into details because it's very technical, but at least for some maybe that know a bit more self-testing, this could be useful. So, well, from just the probability uh, of <clears throat> obtaining a, A1, B1 given X1, Y1, and if these correlations are, are self-testing, I could use that to extract the first state. So I have my local isometry and I'm mapping my my physical measurements and state to reference measurements and state. Okay. Now here, this m a1 x1, because I don't have it in experiment. In experiment, I have some measurements like this. So I just define this m a1 over x1, uh, given x1, as I average over all outputs, all, or all inputs from x2 to xn, and I sum over all outputs from a2 and to an. And similarly, I can do it from measurement corresponding to a1, a2, given x1 and x2. In that case, I would average out over all inputs from x3 to xn and sum over all outputs corresponding to them. So now from, from this here uh, expression, I can see that my, I, my, my local isometry is mapping my, my measurement m acting on a tensor identity acting on 0 to identity acting on, on, on a tensor my reference measurement. And then since this uh, m a1 given x1 represents some sum of uh, several of these, I can see if I look just one of, 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 of this m a1 a2 given x1 x2, then this local isometry should map it to something like this. So it is not trivial to see this, but uh, one can prove that, uh, that this is what isometry does. So here we have just some k that must be positive. And uh, the same happens for, for, for self-testing uh, Bob's measurements. OK, and then given all these conclusions, if we have that uh, our correlations between A2 and B2, given X2 and Y2, are also self-testing, we could write them in terms of exactly these uh, operators, K and L. And OK, here I missed to change. It should be junk state. So it, it should, here should not be Xi, but junk. So in principle, somehow here, the method is that I extract the first state, and then I'm finding a way to see all the, all the rest of correlations that they are acting on the, the junk state, on the thing that I left behind my isometry, let's say. So I extract one state, and then I'm looking correlations on the junk state. And if they are self-testing, I will extract second state. And if I repeat this procedure, I can get to the self-testing of, of, of n states. So in principle, here we see that we can somehow combine all these self-testing protocols. So if I, have, uh, if I have n individual and I put them together and I give them together inputs and I collect together outputs, if all individual are still self-testing, I must have a tensor product of, of my reference experiments. Okay, so now what was the main uh, motivation for us here besides this was to see if I can avoid this huge amount of inputs that I have here. Because if I have n, I need to give them all separately inputs. So if, for example, I say that I want to self-test again n uh, maximum entangled pairs of qubits, but I don't want to give n inputs, I want to see if I can do it with only with a single input. So with, I don't have strings of bits, but I have just one bit for input for both Alice and Bob. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so what would happen here? Let, so let's just uh, re, re, recap. So for CHSH example, if I want to self-test n maximum entangled pairs of qubits, I have input bits x and y, and I have n output uh, bits. So a m bolded is just a string of from a, a, a1 to a n, and b m bolded is a string from b1 to b n. And okay, here I obviously have uh, something that is called completeness, that is the reference experiments does provide n maximal violations. But if I want to go to soundness, this is not um, so simple because, well, I, we can immediately see one possible uh, cheating strategy and that, that show that just n maximal violations are not enough as the parties might share a single maximal entangled pair, so pair of qubits, use it to obtain outputs A1 and B1, and then simply copy the output. So set that all outputs are equal, and this will give me n maximal violations. Okay, so, but uh, this example that, uh, that I just told you about is a bit silly because as in, in every round, the output bit strings are either all zeros or all ones. And then you could say, okay, this is a, something that you don't want and this is something that does not happen if I have my uh, my my reference experiment so we could try to impose that uh, well that uh, let's say all output bit strings must appear not just all zeros and all ones but all possible uh, but okay this is still not enough uh, because uh, the parties can still achieve that and produce n maximal CHSH violations with possessing a single maximum entangled pair of qubits uh, so to describe this, we can just uh, uh, change the point of view and look at CHSH inequality as a game. So uh, if you look at it as a game, the parties need to satisfy the following condition. So this is the winning condition. And if, to maximally violate CHSH inequality, they have maximal probability of winning this game. So again, on one maximal entangled pair of qubits, they, they use it to obtain A1 and B1, and they will satisfy this, this condition with, uh, with optimal probability. And then uh, to simulate maximal relation for all the other uh, for all the other outputs, the parties will just share n minus one uh, classically correlated bits from lambda one to from lambda two to lambda n, and they would fix that a i is a one plus lambda i, and also b i will be b one plus lambda i. So then we see that if a1 and uh, b1 satisfy the CHSH condition, winning condition, so will ai and bi. Okay, so, uh, but here again, we have uh, an important ins insight how to circumvent this, uh, this cheating strategy. So uh, while in the first, uh, first example I showed, all the outputs would be the same, uh, but in this case, uh, in, the, in the second example that I showed you, we see that um, the winning condition is either satisfied for all i's or not satisfied for any of them. So again, we are returning to some, some regularity. So in order to, to circumvent this, uh, we want then to observe some conditional score in the CHSH game. So in the in the standard CHSH game, the winning probability would be probability that A i plus B i are equal to X y. Uh, while if we introduce the conditional CHSH winning probability, it would be the probability that A j plus B j is equal to X y, given that A i plus B i are equal is equal to X y. And then, okay, so if we have our reference experiment, if everything is honest in the honest strategy, so this probability, this conditioning wouldn't change anything. So the probability of AJ, uh, that that jade system uh, satisfy the condition would be, again, the optimal winning uh, probability. While in the in the cheating strategy that is that I described here with this uh, with these classically correlated bits, I would have here this this probability would be one. So then in this case, uh, intuition is that if I see that my conditional CHSH winning probability is larger than the optimal uh, probability to win a single CHSH game, and it, it can go to one, but whenever it is higher than this optimal, there is some, some cheating there and I want to, to, to unravel it. So this is somehow the, the intuition behind, the, behind this and it actually works. And uh, we uh, formalize it by introducing some conditional conditional bell uh, bell values. 
So a standard bell, bell violation or bell value can be written as, a, well, it's just some uh, functional of, of, of correlation probabilities. And then, okay, we say that the maximal quantum violation self test the reference state and reference measurements. And now we want to introduce a conditional bell violation that for every, so string of a i minus one, b i minus one. So this is like for all, for party i, I look at all the outputs that previous parties get, got. So uh, this is a parameter. And I just, instead of p a i b i given x y, I will put p a i b i given x y and all these outputs. So for every uh, outputs of the, of the previous uh, subsystems, I can create this, uh, this conditional bell violation. And then I can normalize it. So I can introduce this average conditional bell violation that I just uh, sum over all these, uh, these output strings and I normalize over total number of, of outputs. Uh, okay. And now we can prove in our theorem that if this average conditional bell value corresponds to the maximal violation of the standard bell inequality for all i's, we can prove the self-testing of a tensor product of n reference states. So, and the thing is that if I have some cheating or some, uh, let's say if I'm using some classical, uh, classical, classically correlated state to, 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 to use, uh, to borrow the, the strategies from, from, from some, some good system that I have inside for some other system, then this average conditional bell violation will be less than the maximal violation of standard bell inequality. So somehow we, we are back to, to the story that we know how to, how to use for self-testing. And well, here again, I would have a short proof outline that is again similar to what I was showing you before in this, uh, in this combining. So like the first pair of outputs, uh, the first pair of, um, for the first pair of inputs, conditional bell value will be equal to standard value because I don't have to condition on anything and I can just do the extraction of the reference date. So I have my local isometry, it maps my uh, physical experiment to my reference experiment. So here, since I don't have many inputs, my m a1 given x that I have here will be just I sum over all the other outputs. And if I want to have m a1 a2 over uh, given x, I will just sum over all the outputs from 3 to n. And then here I see that this, uh, my isometry maps m a1 given x tensor identity to identity tensor m prime a1 given x. And then since this m a1 given x is a, again sum of uh, several of these depending how many different values a2 can take, then I again can conclude that if I want to look at this thing, my local isometry will map it to something like this. So I will, I will still have my, <clears throat> my physical measurement. Okay, so here I need to say that condition for this to work is that this, this reference, so this is reference measurement that it is a rank one projector. So if it's not, it will not work. But here again, I will have some K that is a, a positive and the same thing I will do for Bob. And then for the second pair of inputs, the maximal violation of the average conditional bell expression that I showed you in the last slide, how to, to, to construct, reduces to the standard bell expression written in terms of the junk state that, well, again, I have some double notation and these operators that uh, I define in terms of, 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 of this K, A1, A2, I manipulate them a bit so that what I get are valid measurements. So then this, this, so this, uh, this uh, average conditional bell state value, I can in principle write in terms of, the, of, of, of these, uh, these defined measurements and our junk state. So again, I have the same uh, somehow uh, 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 reasoning that, uh, so for the first pair, I, I just extract the, the reference uh, experiment. And then from the second, like I will have, I, I use these conditional bell values and uh, well, the, the operators and, uh, and, uh, and the junk states that I, I achieved during the, 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 the proving process to extract the second and I could repeat the process and go on until the end. Okay, so well, just to, this is not important. I can skip it because there is much time, but uh, let me just briefly say something about the application. So, well, the, this result that uh, we provide are, well, theoretical. They state that there is an inverse map from the 
correlation set A1 to A and B1 to B and uh, given X and Y uh, to the reference experiment that is tensor product of some states. So now, well, in, in reality, it's difficult to collect these things because, well, we would have to make some ID assumptions. We would have a finite statistics elements. So in order to turn this into really uh, certification protocol, we would need to, to, to handle all these problems. And now, well, I could uh, advertise a bit some, some work that should appear in the, in the next few weeks, but by using finite statistics analysis and churn of like bounds. So uh, we can turn such theoretical result into practical applicable, practically applicable protocols that does not make ID assumption and that uh, circumvents finite statistical uh, problems. So, and then this way we would have a protocol for device independent verification of maximal entangled states of arbitrarily high dimension with the minimal number of inputs. And uh, well, this in turn can provide us with a protocol for the unbounded randomness expansion because we have a single bit of, so we need a random bit for inputs, but we could have uh, outputs that are arbitrarily, arbitrarily long and, uh, and random. Uh, so this is uh, some prospect and some well, motivation for, for, for this work that we did. And well, I, I'm not sure I have enough time to do this outlook and conclusion, but yeah, we could, uh, Combine self-testing protocols to make the big ones. They could be lifted. We could do it with the with the with the minimal number of inputs, and well, we have some interesting mathematical methods to to do this. So with this, yeah, I would uh, thank you for for your attention. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Ivan, for the very nice talk.